Hello, everyone, and welcome to Educative Sessions, a podcast series with people in the developer world about their coding experiences. This is powered by Educative, which makes it easy for authors to provide interactive and adaptive courses for software developers. My name is Li Ngo, and I am the host of Educative Sessions. Today, my guest is Liz Howard, who is a professor, an entrepreneur, a futurist, an artist, all the good things. Uh, Liz, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for that. Yeah, glad to be here. Yeah, so excited. It's been such a long time. Uh, you and I used to work together, of course, although I don't know, maybe once or twice we've actually crossed paths physically, but uh, we have in general, um, I've always known of you through repute, if you will, uh, <laughs> through the stories that you've created uh, and others have created about you. And uh, it, it's honestly been a long time coming for me to have you on our show. Oh, yeah, thanks. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I like to, you know, be introduced by legend. It's always ideal. Oh, stop. <laughs> legend. And I, you know, actually, go ahead. You can say a few more things. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I don't I don't mind. My narcissism does not mind that praise at all. So uh, let's jump right in. You know, I, I know you wear a lot of different hats um, then and even today when it comes to the kind of work that you do. Uh, how um, have all of these different interests now dovetailed into the work that you're doing, the really interesting work in the space of AI. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just to kind of brief uh, background on me, I'm a computer science professor. Uh, I teach all over the place. One of the places I teach is CodePath. Uh, yeah, we work together at Galvanize and I've started a number of schools. I started a school for women. Um, and I've also worked on a lot of big infrastructural projects. I worked on fraud for the top 10 banks in the United States and I worked on uh, Hip camp. I, I helped found that a CTO. So worked on a lot of different projects and, uh, you know, really over the pandemic, of course, like most people, I kind of went inward and wanted to focus on some art projects. And then, of course, uh, instead of doing it in the physical world, I ended up making computer art projects. And so I started doing a lot of AI art um, right. and I played with a bunch of like style transfer things on a number of photos and then when the clip and vq gan like sys generative system kind of came out i started playing a lot with that and i realized like oh ai art is about to explode so that's kind of how i got there yeah it's fascinating yeah and i mean we'll get more and more into uh what it means for ai to be creating art and how is that defined uh and one thing you mentioned is that AI, to understand this really diff complex uh, concept, I would say, um, it's more about a story than about um, the technology that's actually building it. Um, could you explain that a little bit more and also how um, it might help others to want to also participate in uh, um, AI art in this manner? Yeah. Well, to talk about that, I think we first have to define what we mean by AI. And I think a lot of different people hear the term AI and they think of different things, right? And so what most people think of when they think of AI is like Siri and Alexa, right? Uh, these assistants. And what really uh, drives that being uh, an AI is the fact that we can anthropomorphize them readily. We can kind of imagine that they have these personalities because they do sound like people we might be talking to over the phone. So it's easy for us to project this concept of a self or an identity onto like Siri and Alexa, right? And that's how a lot of people think of AI. But if you think about what does Siri and Alexa really do, well, they're good at listening to what you're saying and understanding what you mean, as in they do natural language processing. But they're really just able to do things that like web forms or apps can already do. They can tell you when the movie is happening or like what the headlines are for today, but basically they're just your phone, but with voice, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, do they really have like a sense of self or like, do we have to get into consciousness with Siri? Not really, because Siri's just like a website. We don't really think, is a website conscious, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but people did when the web first came out, like right. they really thought of it like it was a conscious being. And so um, there's that anthropomorphization, anthropomorphization, I uh, can't say the word, but anyway, you know, where we project that you're a person, right? Right, 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 right. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's, so that's part of AI. But then when you talk to technologists or investors and startups, the VCs, 
they think of machine learning largely like and computer vision um, and they do sometimes think of like assistants or chatbots, natural language processing, but sometimes, um, you know, an AI can just be a, a system thinking ahead for you, right? Like when Google adds your flight details automatically to your calendar, that sort of feels like AI, but it's really not. It's, you know, it's, it's a very simple script to identify flight details, right? So, so before I, um, I want to just make clear, like when it comes to, this is, it's, this is a semantics question, it seems like, um, and I think the exercise you're doing is really helpful. Uh, you know, I know f f the automatic inclination when we talk about this is that anthropomorphization, um, most specifically, it's almost like a narcissistic thing of just like, how is this thing like us? And, and how, what does that mean? Um, which I like the fact that, you know, de uh, demystifying a lot of machine learning means that uh, let's not... In It'd be uh, think about the question of how this is a supplanting of humanity, but mm -hmm. more of an enablement of sorts, of more of um, uh, a predictor of sorts. You know, um, yeah. Um, or, or I mean, that, but that's a simple way to, to talk about it. But I do like the ways in which, uh, or in way, or or I'd say the most fascinating ways when people think of machine learning in particular is that not only is it doing things that humans can do, but it's doing things that humans cannot do. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is something that we actually do see value in and not necessarily in an anxiety inducing way. Is that, mm -hmm. is that fair to say? I, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. A machine doesn't get bored and it doesn't forget things. And so it's very good at doing things humans can't do, like always remembering to remind you every mm -hmm. week without fail to take the trash out or something like that. Right. right, right, right. Um, it never it never breaks down, never has a bad day and kind of just like needs a break. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing that like computers can do that we can't. And that it seems like not a lot sometimes, but it's actually a huge deal. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's there's other things that it can do. Like, I mean, there, machines can help us to reach out and connect to people. They can organize information. But realistically, like when you get an email and you know that it was automated, you don't care about that email, but when a person sends you that, um, you care, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a, a lot of fear, I think, that like AI can replace us and AI can replace us doing things that we generally don't want to do, right. but it can't really replace us in a lot of the ways that really matter the most, like being a person whose opinions you care about, right? Like mm -hmm. nobody cares what Siri thinks of them, you know? Right, right, right. Um, and so that's kind of the, the difference really. And, and that's largely why I started this whole thing was there's a lot of people out there that kind of believe that a certain amount of the internet maybe is made just entirely by AI, right? And it can really seem that way, especially how similar all humans are and they tend to kind of comment the same things over and over again. So there's a lot of people out there that really believe that that like a lot of content isn't real, but mm -hmm. AI is not as sophisticated as it seems. And largely what people are doing when they use AI to make content is there's an actual artist doing real art and thinking about what to put out there. They're thinking about you, the art of the audience. Mm -hmm. And so the art that comes out is, uh, or the content or any of this stuff, it, it's, it's done by a person. It's just done at a size that a person couldn't really do it. You know, a machine can make 20,000 images where a person can make one. And so that's like the kind of thing that the machine can do that we can't. It's just like stay on task all day and all night, you know? Right. And I mean, that's really impressive. Um, at the same time, you've been, you know, also careful to not hype this too much and uh, mm -hmm. to be very uh, cautious about the real capacities and limits of uh, AI. So um, mm -hmm. what are some of those limitations? I think we've kind of discussed it in light of when it comes to say day-to-day uh, -day activities, but let's say from an artist's perspective, right? Now we're getting into the territory of, you know, an AI can produce 20,000 different works of art, but uh, what is the difference between what that uh, AI is doing versus what a human could be doing with just even one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like, so an AI can reproduce or make a lot of different samples of something, but it's very bad at coming up with, for example, new ideas, right? 
it can mix things that it has seen before, mm -hmm. but it really can't like put concepts together in a way that like are meant to say something. It can accidentally arrange concepts to where right. they seem like they mean something, but the machine itself doesn't mean it. And so you, by being the artist, you like choose the pieces of output that you will actually promote or put out there, right? right. And okay. so, yeah, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people that are worried like AI, like it'll grow out of control, kind of like Skynet, it'll start itself up and then we won't be able to shut it down. But like, you know, someone has to type, you know, Python, like go, right? Uh, and so it can't start itself up. It can't really generate input without human intervention. It doesn't come up with ideas. Like if I want to paint a crocodile in a top hat riding a scooter, you know, like I have to, I just came up with that now. And like, it can't quite do but, that. But yeah, from, from my hearing that I can at least make those associations through context. Uh, you know, I, I suddenly thought of a, several things. Well, one was, like I like the Skynet thing comes up a lot, and thank you Terminator for planting that in our heads. <laughs> um, but it sounds like you're describing that Skynet's much more of like say a young, moody, nihilistic teenager or something like that that has no, uh, or a misanthropic teenager perhaps that just doesn't believe a lot in humanity. Well, it seems like AI, at least in its current form, and maybe could be in perpetuity, is a lot more like a like a four year old child that really wants to show you their finger painting. And, yeah. and and it looks beautiful in a way, but it also hard to, like some of that art could be accidental or some of it can be what have you. Um, and oh, there was some other thing I wanted to mention, but uh, it was something along the lines of um, how um, in general, though, when it comes to uh, like the way that these technologies work is that um, I've, yeah, uh, I found them to be like very inspirational in a lot of ways, but then... Um, but but I think the way that you described it is exactly right. That like, there's that that proactivity, that ingenuity, um, is completely lacking without any uh, real initiative. Like there's always it's like it might say a lot more about us as a pessimistic humanity to say, well, this is what's going to happen. Versus you know, also nothing could happen. Like the AI doesn't doesn't have that sort of self starting initiative that you're looking for in interviews, right? <laughs> Right. Yeah. It's, it's very good at predicting. It's almost like trying to write a term paper with, uh, you know, Google docs is autocomplete, right? Like right. you could That's probably right. finish sentences pretty well with Google docs autocomplete, but could you like describe some of the key like trade factors in this particular war that happened? You know, like, no, you can't really do that. You yeah. Know. I just realized the thing I want is, and, and the one, uh, example of all this that I thought of was um, I, you know, um, passionate about filmmaking, and one of the things that made the rounds was the. Um, do you remember? It was like a short screenplay about Batman, after oh, yeah. someone had trained an eye like hundreds of hours of watching Batman, yes. and as someone who's like I, I mean, I wish some what it would be like if someone wasn't a Batman fan, um, could read it and be like, what is this about? This makes no sense. As someone like me, who's a pretty intense Batman fan, uh, like it still made no sense, but I could understand what it was trying to reference, like what how it looks, how it seems like the AI looks at this uh, data that it's deriving from is just so different from how a human might. And um, there's something, but it might be similar to how a four year old would write a version of Batman, right? Right. Yeah. yeah, it's it's like copying some features that it sees, but it doesn't understand the significance of those features. Right. Yeah. And okay. so okay. you just see it sort of it's almost like you've heard somebody kind of when they sound like they're, they're trying to sound like they know what they're talking about and they're really just pattern matching. Right. Mm -hmm. Like AI is that like, exactly. it, you know, it's not going to steal your job. It's that guy at work who kind of pretends like he knows what he's talking about and doesn't doesn't really know. Just I says, don't know oh, what you mean as someone who used to work with you. I do not. If I don't know <laughs> what you mean, then I was probably that person. Right. <laughs> uh, I think we both know who that person is. Oh, I'm, 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 I say nothing. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's protect ourselves and say nothing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would love to know, I, I wanted to, I still want to push this question of AI itself. Um, how does AI know that it's creating art in a way? Is it, is it at least self-aware enough to say that this is creativity or this is, um, you know, a certain sort of like layered randomness, right? So, and this is where it kind of gets complicated, right? And I don't feel like I really have the 
answer. I have, you know, a number of data points, right? Like the way that the art is generated is uh, I have one algorithm that just generates a kind of a random image and just like slightly changes it. And then I have another algorithm that looks at that image and says, what is in it? It classifies it, right? And so when those two work together, the one that slightly changes the image just does that 10,000 times. And then the one that classifies it like slowly picks the one that's closest and closer and closer to what it is that I said to paint right now the way that the the model that can classify images was trained was on a bunch of our paintings humans made them right it was trained on uh, the creative commons image data set and so it has seen every painting that we basically have in museums essentially right and then when I say stuff it's basically looking for things that it's seen in our paintings so in this way it's a little bit closer to and I don't know how to say his name if it's Jung or Jung or whatever but uh it's his unconscious, his oh, collective you know, Jungian, unconscious. Jungian? Okay. Jungian, yeah. Oh, there you, uh, there you, go. you know, uh, his, his collective unconscious idea, that's what AIs really are. They just mm. seen a whole bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. There's another AI called ImageNet that'll do the same thing. It's just seen the internet, right? Like all mm. the images or like the top few million images on Google, right? Yeah. And so it's, uh, when, it, when it generates these images, it's just looking at things that we humans have labeled as stuff. And so is it saying something? Well, it depends. It depends on what you ask it to paint. Mm -hmm. Like if you ask it to paint a dragon or a lady in a dress, like it's probably not really saying anything. Mm -hmm. But if you ask it to paint like transcendence or ensoulment, Mm -hmm. or the development of man or like mm -hmm. you know you ask it to paint something very uh abstract right. it will put a lot of symbols together like it is trying to say something and i don't know what it's you know like i don't know is that it is that it trying to communicate because it doesn't have any other way to talk really right. it has no other way to output I mean, it seems like this is in absolute terms. How do we answer this question? Right. Do we have right. the same kind of standard for humanity? What if we I would ask the same of you or I like Liz right. paint, you know, insolment for me. And you did the exact same method as the AI one could say. Exactly. Um, but, but who's to say? I mean, to me, I guess that's the question is, you know, I, I wonder. I think what it does, I don't know if there's a like a good or bad or right or wrong. And certainly that's not what I'm interested in. More of like. If this is what the technology is able to do, then it, I think, is very much a looking glass kind of situation where exactly. we start to see, oh, this is where human ingenuity actually comes from, if it's happening. Or maybe it might sort out, okay, you know what, this person that's been an artist the whole time, they're just putting things together. This is nonsense. This is not really art. They're just, uh, uh, but this person here, there's something going on, at least I think. Um, at the very least, it might, I would be fascinating if, um, there were, where the technology around art criticism might be, where um, do, do AI have the same ability that like curators and others do to say, to help at least in some way, um, yeah. sort out what could be worthy of anyone's attention, right? Yeah, I mean, I've run classifiers on like uh, aesthetics and beauty and other like features that I've been able to like kind of arbitrarily assign. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the classifiers that I'm able to run are able to tell which uh, pictures are the most beautiful or the most symmetrical or the most okay. striking. We can use a lot of words that art critics use because most of these AIs have actually read what art critics are saying about paintings and like that's what they know about the painting. Right. And so whatever the voice of so whatever whenever uh it it describes these paintings a lot of times i find it using art critic language because yeah. that's i mean that's mostly what it's right yeah and uh, is are there outputs almost like in like if you had to do like a turing test of them are the outputs almost indistinguishable like is this art criticism by a human or is this actually from an ai it's, no i mean you can distinguish because art critics make a long point kind of and it takes them maybe two or three paragraphs to kind of like describe why 
That's but like an like AI an is but, like okay. it just makes a bunch of statements, and so it just makes mm. like sentences, and the sentences don't necessarily connect. And that's like where we're at. But I mean, that's the third grade, you know, like mm -hmm. kids in the third grade are making like two sentence stories, right? And paragraphs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and AIs are like just there. That's where their growth edge is. Growth edge is. So, uh -huh. you know, we got like third and fourth graders in some cases, but you know, they don't have bodies. And so like, they're not learning that they know they know how to paint really well and, and okay. type <laughs> so that's impressive yeah, yeah. so uh, let's talk about uh, how you are thinking about this from much more of a business context right and yeah. uh, I'd love to know more about like like right now we live in an era where uh, especially with the rise of uh, non-fungible tokens or nfts the artist mm -hmm. has become an interesting player when it comes to uh, technology today in this web three era. So I would love to know where, what your hot take is on it. Like, uh, what is it? Um, where is the state of business now? Um, what is the state of digital compositions? Uh, yeah. what gets people really excited? Yeah. Well, I mean, with art, uh, and with any business, it's largely a function of marketing. Um, and so like, is the fact that something is an NFT, does that make it more valuable? Not really. Like you did spend the money maybe to mint it, but it doesn't really like add in any kind of intrinsic value, except to the people who very much want to acquire NFTs. And so if you can get your art in front of them regularly enough that they want to buy it, cool, that it will work. But if you, if you don't, then it kind of won't matter. And so the thing about AI art, it's, it doesn't feel scarce to some people, but to other people, it feels very cool and very interesting and new and like the hot new thing. And I predict we're going to see a lot of NFTs that are AI generated either with, you know, acknowledgement that that's what's happening or not. Um, but it's really gonna be largely just like any business, any art business about marketing and not about like, is the NFT cool enough, right? Um, it's gonna be about, you know, all those other things that are kind of what's driving a lot of NFT stuff, what right. Web3 stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and that's honestly my hope. Um, I mean, yeah. I have expressed in previous discussions on the show uh, how cynical I am about this, but I do like this next wave when the technologists and the artists come back in who are not thinking about this in terms of transactional value, but much more in terms of um, its you know, technological potential or uh, what this might do to actually support creators out there who historically have been, you know, largely uh, had their work either stolen or exploited in some way. And it's yeah. nice to hear that there might be some potential for them being protected. So oh, all yeah. very exciting stuff, right? Yeah, it's really uh, exciting. All right, Liz, uh, we've come to the end, believe it or not, two of our uh, questions, and I'd love to give you an opportunity to talk about the new exciting work that you're doing in this space. So oh, yeah. the floor is yours. Well, so uh, I wanted to kind of explore like how much of a typical type of like what we might understand as a small business can really be handled by AI. So um, <clears throat> what I did was, I mean, after I made a bunch of this AI art, uh, I realized I love it. It's very colorful. I want to plaster it over every single surface in my house. But um, printing stuff out costs about as much as like a t-shirt, you know, a single print is like a t-shirt. And so I decided to put it on t-shirts. And then when I got the first shipment of like t-shirts and dresses that I had put all of this AI art on, I realized like, oh, this is both very cool and there's nobody else doing this right now. But, um, you know, I realized like there's, there's so much space for all these algorithms to explore that like ev if every person got on and started making AI art, like we'd still not run out of AI art to explore. So it's, it's, uh, what I've discovered is that you can run a lot of a business with AI, right? Like you can make the art to put on your objects with AI. After you figure out what print on demand products you want to use, like you can make a database of those and then you can have a computer automatically put the art onto the objects, right? You can have it tweet, you can have it compose videos using the models. And these are all like, I don't, I've never like made any of my physical products. It's all made by AI. 
Um, and so that's like the simple e-commerce part of it. But the marketing part, like AI can write marketing copy. It can write your tweets. It also knows when to tweet and who to tweet at. Um, you can have your AI like uh, analyze different products and find similar products and then analyze what keywords those have and like do the advertising. Uh, all the advertising that I'm doing is, is run by AI. Yeah. So what else do I use AI for? Uh, oh, and I use GitHub Copilot. So anything that I have to write that is a script, I use GitHub Copilot. And um, it's very powerful. GitHub Copilot, like it's not going to write the whole web server for you, but it it will write like 80% of it. You know, wow. you will not have to type a lot. It's like autocomplete times a million, you know? Right, right, right. Like it, you just, still it, it know almost you knows what your thoughts are as right as you're starting to manifest them. And that's helpful. Right. right. Exactly. So. I would say like, you know, in terms of like what you would call this thing in like a fantasy book, they're like golems, right? You know, they're like spirits you summon that could do one thing and then they're done, you know, and they're gone. Uh, and that's I all they contemporaries can do call those me seeks, but that's you know neither here nor there, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, me seeks. I mean, me seeks are more like general artificial intelligence because you can give them high level stuff like take two swings off my golf game, right? <laughs> right. If I mean, presumably that's a simple task, right? Yes. Right. Sounds simple. I right? um, you've humbled me with your uh, ability to dive deep into that reference. So well done. <laughs> Uh, well, that's fantastic. And is there any way to kind of check out your work? Or... Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's all up at artmonster.dev. Yeah. Um, it's a bunch of AI fashion and stuff like that. And the proceeds go to my child's education. So <laughs> oh. it's pretty good. Support the children. I mean, that's yeah. I mean, how, how are we supposed to argue with that? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, Liz, uh, thank you so much for finally being on the show and sharing all of your really impressive stuff. And I've honestly had so much fun talking to you about this topic. It's such a fascinating world we live in now, and yet there's still so much more to go through as well as so much more to rethink as we're going through it too. So thank you so much. For sure. Yeah. I want to thank everyone else for listening or watching this podcast online as well. You can check out more of our talks on YouTube, or you can check out our uh, audio versions on any major podcasting app. And uh, finally, if you want to learn a little bit more about Educative, visit us at educative.io. So for all of us here at Educative, thank you so much and happy learning. Bye-bye now. Happy learning. Hi there. Hope you enjoyed this Educative session. Be sure to check out more on YouTube or on any podcasting app. And be sure to like this episode and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Happy learning.